So we're back and we're about to, uh, to start the data science workshop. Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce the, the speakers who'll be uh, conducting the workshop. Uh, so first is Niraj Madan, who's a data scientist with IBM with over 15 years of experience in data science and strategy consulting. He's currently leading the data science practice for IBM Cloud Client Experience. Uh, next is Maureen Norton, who is Chief Analytics Officer and Marketing Intelligence Professional at IBM. Uh, Maureen is the Global Data Scientist Professional Lead, helping to grow the skills and ex expertise of data scientists. And finally, we have Upkar Litter, who's a data scientist with IBM. Uh, he's an IBM data science and AI developer advocate with 16 years of experience in IT management development, including team management, functional and technical leadership roles with a deep experience in full stack technology. Uh, so, Niraj, Maureen, and Upkar, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Niraj, I believe you're going to share the screen. Yes, that's then right. Can, okay, then we can get started. <clears throat> Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. I hope you were able to join us for the earlier part of the Data Science Day as part of the Open Group Workshop, uh, Open Group Day. Um, there were some wonderful presentations, and I, I think we're going to be building on some of those concepts here. But let me welcome you to the Data Science Workshop. In this, we're hoping that we'll give you an experiential journey with data, but the real point is to inspire your work. So we'll use an example but what we really want to do is, as we go through this session, have you think of different kinds of problems that would apply in your work environment so that you can start uh, thinking through some of the issues you might have, get some assistance from, uh, you know, the, the folks here on the call, as well as colleagues who are in the workshop who may have some expertise they can share in the chat. So let's go to the next chart and we'll talk a little bit about how we're gonna structure the workshop today. So we're getting started, of course, uh, 9.15 Pacific time. And we had sent out pre-workshop setup instructions. So hopefully everybody has had a chance to go there and start to get set up for this. Um, and we'll again have some support available for folks if they're having any difficulty with that. Next chart, please. So here's what we're going to do. Maureen, in terms I, of, I'm yes. wondering if you could just speak a little louder. It sounds uh, oh, having a little trouble with the volume. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Let me. I can switch headphones. Yeah, you already sound better. Thanks. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe just getting. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, also, Maureen, while you're doing that, Niraj, I'm not sure if there's an issue with your um, display there, but we're, what we're seeing is a fairly thin uh, sort of slide uh, and a lot of black space on the right and left of it. So, okay. don't know if you can, can try it again. One, yeah, I'm going to do that. One second. I assume your colleagues are seeing the same that I am. Yeah, I'm just going to leave here. Thank you. Is it better? Still loading. Yeah, go to. Yes, yes that's much that's... better. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do today, we're going to have a kind of a getting started session where we're just going to go through some expectations, uh, a brief introduction in data science talking about some predictive analytics, machine learning solutions. And as I mentioned, this is experiential, so we really want to be able to create a project. So then we're gonna go into an example that has applicability across various industries. And that is a net promoter score example. So we'll dive into a little bit of that and take you through each of the steps that are critical to creating your project, the business understanding. We always start with the business problem. Data understanding, data prep, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. So we're gonna go through that kind of version of the life cycle so that you can then have a better sense of what it's gonna to take to implement a project in your own organization. Next chart, please. All right, so the first thing is let's talk about data. 
if you were able to join us on the earlier sessions, there was some just excellent insights presented by Seth Dobrin, Beth Rudin, and Louder Ostrovich because they they've each shared something that really was relevant to this workshop today. And that is, you know, the importance of of data, of data governance, um, and really focusing on thinking about your sources of data. We want to make sure that as we build systems, we build them in such a way that they will be um, considered trustworthy, right? So that we always manage and try to make sure there isn't bias and that sort of thing. So there's all kinds of um, ways that we can do that. And so we're going to hit on that very lightly. Uh, but right now, kind of let's think about data. So if you have a business problem, and again, always start with the business problem that you're trying to solve, you can get pretty innovative about the types of data and the sources that may be able to help you with that. So, you know, there are some sources of data that have information that could help you with pretty much any topic, anywhere or anytime. And you know, that is something that yeah, I wanted to use as one of our first examples. Is there a source of data that has their finger on the pulse of what people think at any given moment in time, anywhere in the world, on any given topic? And if you go to the next chart, most of you will probably not be too surprised to see that such a source of data is Twitter. Um, there are, it, it is a wealth of information about any topic that you wanted to do some research on. So again, I'm using this as one example of a source of data that maybe you aren't considering. So the CEO of Twitter a few years back was speaking at an IBM conference, and he told a compelling story that has stuck with me uh, ever since. And he said he was feeling very, you know, powerful about all of the data that they had at their fingertip that they could help any business you know, that wanted to tap into it, and it was a terrific resource. And then he described a rather humbling experience one day where a CEO of a commercial fryer uh, company came in, and he explained, you know, that he wanted to access Twitter's data uh, to help his business. And so as he explained what his business was, the CEO was very perplexed on how he could actually help him. Um, he was a uh, commercial fryer operator, I mean, not operator, uh, manufacturer. And so what that means is as you go into a fast food restaurant, when maybe they're doing French fries or crisps, depending on where you live in the world, what they're called, um, there would be these large commercial fryers, dip, you know, they dip in the food in the oil and it's coming out. And so those are the things that he created and manufactures. And the you know, CEO of Twitter just kind of was leaning back in his chair thinking, this is probably the first business that I've run into that I don't have anything that could help them. But the innovative manufacturer said, no, actually you do have something that could help me tremendously. Um, but he said, but nobody tweets about the commercial fryer as they go in and get some fast food or something else. Nobody comes out and says, gee, what a great commercial fryer they had in that place. And he said, no, they don't do that. But what they do do is they'll tweet about something they're not happy about. And particularly on the next chart, soggy fries. So nobody likes to get soggy fries, right? They're supposed to be crisp and fresh and hot. But if the commercial fryer isn't working as it should, you can end up with what you see right here. And definitely people go, and we'll tweet about it. They tweet about a lot of things, including something as um, what you might think is insignificant as soggy fries. But looking at data through a very innovative lens, what this uh, manufacturer knew is that he could use geospatial data, figure out where the complaints were coming from, you know, and, and then map out whether those were his commercial fryers, in which case, then he would know they need some maintenance. And so he could dispatch maintenance to make sure that they're fixed. Or alternatively, if they were a competitor's fire, uh, commercial fire, he could then use that information to make sales calls and, you know, and try to basically sell 
his commercial practice. So he was using something, I bet if you've ever uh, tweeted about soggy fries, you would never have imagined that that could actually be turned into and monetized as value, that kind of data. So if we go to the next chart, I wanted to also you know, talk about other types of data and what other types of data can be used to drive those deeper insights. And I'm sure that all of you here probably have some, some ideas. Feel free to engage in the chat with each other if you want about different types of data that you can add to your existing data sets to provide deeper insights. Um, a lot of times innovation comes from putting two things together that just haven't been put together before. A, a classic example is uh, suitcases and wheels. Right? There was at one point somebody got a patent because they had the idea to take your basic suitcase and put wheels on. It. And now it's probably hard to buy a suitcase without wheels. But that was putting two things together in a new and innovative way that enabled a, a whole new solution. So, likewise, we can think about data in that way and like how you can put different things together. And, you know, another example is on the next chart, which is weather data. So there is a wealth of information on weather data. Retailers use this quite frequently to be able to determine, um, you know, different inventory levels. You know, obvious examples would be in the winter, in a very cold, snowy area, you're going to, as a retailer, want to stock up supplies and things that will make, you know, uh, will be more in demand at that point. Uh, but weather data can be really mined and used in a lot of different ways to augment different things and to gain insights into additional data. So I wanted to really try to get you to think broadly and innovatively about data sources that you can use in light of the business problem we are trying to solve. So the, the real key point is always start with the business problem um, and then you can seek out the sources of information that will be most helpful to you and then try to get some innovation going in there in terms of putting putting those wheels on the luggage, if you will, in your problem so that you can drive those deeper insights. So I'm going to now turn it over to Niraj uh, to take us into the next steps. Yep. Thank you, Maureen, and uh, great examples on uh, Twitter and uh, you know the weather data. I think so today's workshop uh, in a way it's very interesting because uh, you know it involves it involves all of us and uh, the reason I say that is because by the end of this workshop you know we what our goal that we have kept for ourselves is to give you a set of templates or you can say a, a plug and play structure where you all can uh, pick up a problem and uh, like fill in the blanks and that becomes your journey in data science and that's why uh, we're calling it like a real journey uh, and, and kind of a workshop that we are driving today. So, so throughout the workshop, uh, like as you would see, uh, we will have few exercises where we'll be uh, asking you for input. So, you know, and, and share templates that you can reuse after this workshop for any uh, AI products that you are uh, developing from scratch or if you are at any phase of the project you're already on, you'll find a lot of templates which would be reusable uh, in this workshop. And, uh, you know, and everything is posted on GitHub. So we'll go through that. But I think with that, uh, thank you, Maureen. And uh, so moving on from here, I think like we saw uh, two examples and uh, and whenever we work with, you know, there are like tons and tons of problems around us that when we when we talk about which can be solved using data. And we talked about Twitter, weather, but I think broadly, uh, like from the from the time we start interacting with our stakeholders or start working with the businesses, uh, when the problems are, you know, kind of uh, thrown at us, we generally uh, need a framework to be able to uh, bucket, like what kind, what class of problem is is this right now? I mean, that I'm dealing with, so that we can go for the deep dive. So, in broadly, uh, in data science, there are four classes of problems: risk, quality, uh, customer set, and anything around price, you know, cost value as such. So, if you talk about risk as an example out there. You know, it can be, it can range from anywhere where, you know, if there is a, we're talking about at the airport where the passengers been screened for threats or talking about credit card transactions 
or the loan approval. I mean, you talk about anywhere we are talking about any sort of risk is involved. All those sort of problems can be classified into the first bucket, which is like a risk assessment out there. So that's the first bucket. I mean, that you could classify and say, okay, I'm looking at a lot of uh, pictures and my, I have to build a model, which are the fake pictures versus the real one and same stands for news, you know, and uh, the video photos, or I mean, any sort of such problems you can classify in the first bucket. Uh, then the second one out there, is around uh, a quality defect. I mean, definitely largely in the manufacturing setup. And, and the weather data example is quite perfect, uh, even around ATM machines like failure, you know, or, uh, you know, also, I mean, I think, and that brings a point, I remember that one of my colleagues worked on a problem where they were working on how often the machines should be filled in and, and weather data played a very important role in that. And servers, when you talk about it, you know, multiple variables can, can, you know, help with that in terms of what, is it a hard drive or what component kind of leads to a server failure, you know, on and on. So, and then castings, as you can see the car, you know, a toy car out there, you know, or in the real scenario, there's a defect, I mean, and what variables cost it. So any of these sort of problems around quality and defect is like another bucket to classify such problems. Uh, and the third one is around uh, business value or customer side. And I think that's the bucket we, we will be focusing on today. And uh, uh, net promoter score is a very widely used term, but uh, we, we are not going to make any assumptions in today's session because that, uh, you know, you've heard of it or not, but we'll start from even explaining that what is NPS, how it's calculated, everything we're going to cover in this workshop uh, from scratch. So, so, but I mean to say that SAT, customer SAT or value kind of, you know, uh, area is like another bucket altogether. And with the house pricing, you know, being all time high and, uh, you know, stocks now picking up, as you can see from last <laughs> one or two days again. Uh, so, I mean, anything around price, cost, value would fall in, under the four buckets, you know, in the fourth bucket, uh, which is around, I mean, how much rentals, estimates, the value of the house. I mean, all those kind of things would fall under the fourth bucket. So there are broadly like four classes of problems around which majority of the projects can be defined. So that's so the reason I'm explaining is so whenever you are dealing with a set of problems, so first we should start thinking about that. Okay, so what class of problem am I dealing with? Because and that's where you start to go to the next level. So starting with the with this one. So once you have identified what problem that I'm dealing with, then it comes about. Okay, what is the right approach or what analytics approach am I going to be applying in this problem? So we go very step by step. We found which bucket it belongs to. And then we are like, okay, get a little more technical and we say, okay, what is the analytic approach we are going to apply uh, to solve this problem? And while it's a very exhaustive chart, uh, but I think uh, going from the workshop scope, what we are covering to today and how you read this chart. So first thing we ask the question that, okay, in the scenario that I'm trying to solve for my business or for my customer, am I predicting an amount? Like, is there a value that I'm predicting like a house price or anything as such, you know, if I'm predicting that, then it goes into the class of problem, which is the forecasting uh, linear regression or decision tree. And if we are not predicting an amount, we are predicting, you know, uh, kind of, you know, we are, we are not predicting, I would say like an amount, like an amount as such, then it goes on, are we predicting an event uh, for event to happen? Is machine gonna fail or not? Is server gonna fail or not? Is customer gonna be happy or unhappy? You know, so all those kind of events problems, then these are the another set of algorithms we can apply. And if it's not that, then we, and if it's a very exploratory analysis, then we go into, you know, approaches like clustering in that scenario. So, so I would, the reason I'm sharing this is because it's always like a starting point and we need like a, you know, framework to start thinking through and navigate. So while these are few of the examples given here, there are many other algorithms, but this is like us getting started uh, to solving a data science problem from start to end. And that's the goal of this workshop that by the end of it, I mean, you run the code with us, uh, you know, what we have created and uh, starting from, you know, reading the data to uh, checking the quality to kind of going on to next steps, we'll talk about it. But this, so far we talked about two steps. One, looking at the bigger buckets, then after that, uh, looking at the analytics approach, which are available to us. And then if you go for the deep dive, I mean, I would say large class of problems in today's time, what we are dealing, uh, falls in the bucket on the top. But I mean, if there are some more uh, advanced problems that you're looking at would be in the second bucket, which is at the bottom. But I've mentioned that for all of you for your reference. Now, once we have got that, I mean, and this is one of my, uh, you know, favorite uh, 
uh, chart i would say that actually uh, helps you helps you with the whole framework you know start to end on how a data science project goes and where do you start where it ends i mean what are the key deliverables and 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 often i mean what i have seen is like majority of the organizations you know coming coming and following agile methodology it becomes more and more stand up oriented you know uh, culture where you kind of go report what you're doing and and sometimes these data science projects could be very research driven where you say okay i'm going to spend reading some time and you know and it becomes very hard to quantify that what we are trying to accomplish in every stage of the project every week or every month and that is where these frameworks can play a very important role uh, for us to communicate with the business or our stakeholders because people can't just wait for 6 months and a year and say some magic will happen and algorithm will be created and the predictions predictions will happen it be, it has become more and more eventually important to to tell the stakeholders around that what stage of the project you are on what value it is bringing on and and be able to document that so what this chart uh, is explaining is the key phases you know of the project and and this chart comes from two sources basically so one of the uh, one of the top data mining methodology in the industry is uh, crisp dm uh, that's one and the second is from the book that i was uh, i had my hands on which is from uh, sebastian rushka so the top part is from the crisp dm and the bottom part is from the book uh, from sebastian rushka they both are pretty much communicating the same thing but just a different way of looking at the journey of a project so so if you see uh, how we start whenever we are we are kind of you know working on a project from scratch and we start i mean the first thing what we get on, get with we start we start assessing the situation okay what is the situation i am in what problem i am solving and you know then we'll take an example on each of these area we're going to explain through this case study but to get a broader understanding first part is always to assess the situation uh then we look at the methodology and then then it's like you know what methods i'm going to use like in the last example i was mentioning uh then it's about benchmarks because uh it's always important to see what i'm trying to accomplish has all any anybody already done it not and and seeing a reference or if we, you you've been the first one to do it i mean that's also a good thing to know but if some benchmarks are available uh it's always good to have them and then once you have done the groundwork then it's about objectives then we start looking at features features i mean can be a little technical term but i would say features is what data variables are we going to be looking at and uh, once we have the data then it's all about checking the quality because as we all know i mean if the data is not reliable the output is not going to be reliable so then we so that's when the phase of business data understanding goes then we move on to data prep where we start because a machine would never ever understand the data we have it so we have to code it in the form the machine can understand and that is where the steps around extraction scaling and selection will come into play and we are going to do it hands on today in our notebook and uh, once the data is in a form where the where the machine can read and understand that that is when the time comes where we start model we start selecting and creating a model and evaluate that and then the time is demo time we create a demonstration because nobody uh, from the business would actually would be lot interested on what the back end goes and how you did the algorithm and all that what they all want is how you can explain them what your model is doing and this case study can give you some examples on how to keep the information as simple as possible for the business to be able to consume it and then the next step is about how do you integrate it in the production so everybody can start using your work uh, and the outputs from that and another way of another language i would say you know it's about you know like if you see the parallel references that came from the book is around creating a path raw data training testing data set uh, let the algorithm learn there's a final model and then there is a kind of a new data on which you try to make predictions and often time i mean uh, it's been like the uh, you know one of my favorite quote uh, you know that people say i mean you know okay so this model is useless you know so we generally said that essentially all models are wrong but some are useful because it's always an assistance and they they can never ever be 100% you know accurate but there is something is better than nothing you know so there are some models which are useful so it's always and we are always working on probability so this is a kind of a framework on the road map to kind of building any machine learning solution starting from a concept to a product and and this i would say i mean if you keep this in mind and start filling the blank and we'll look at one kind of example is where we uh, started with
And uh, then uh, I think with this, uh, so there are like many, many tools available out there. Uh, there are like tons and tons, uh, starting from IBM Watson Studio to, I mean, Google Cloud, Azure, you know, SageMaker, many, many SaaS also. Uh, just because, I mean, we work on Watson Studio and there's a free trial. Uh, so we we just using that, but you can pretty much uh, if you later you want for now you can follow us along in Watson Studio, and later if you want uh, you can use the same notebook in other platforms also, uh, with some minor tweaks and that should work for you. And uh, with this, I think uh, I don't know is the chat uh, enabled for everyone to post? I mean, uh... yes, everybody can post into the chat channel. So I have a question for all of you. I mean, just so that, I mean, you know, uh, we don't get the meetings by the end of the workshop. So I wanted to ask all of you, and if you want to post your responses on the chat, which is, uh, and the question is, uh, you know, this one. I wish I could do the poll, but I mean, yeah, if you want to post your responses on the chat, that'll be very helpful for us to see. Yeah. And, uh, you know, stay on track on your expectations. And... So what, what's your option? I mean, you know, uh, what's your expectations from this uh, workshop? <laughs> what are option three? Okay. Second, okay. Okay, two, three, oh, okay. Let's have a journey, okay, cool, thank you. Let's see, wow, okay. Yeah, just give well, it. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. You think so? I was going to ask. Uh, well, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. I was just going to test my mic while oh, they answer the question. But good. Thank oh, you. Oh no, that's good. That's good. I'm excited. I mean, yeah, we're looking for you all to talk also, so that's very uh, kind of good that you could test it. Yeah, good. Okay. So thank you for sharing. I think yeah, and uh, next two hours oh, man. <laughs> okay. So, so I think summarizing on these options, the reason I kind of, you know, asked and I see, uh, I mean, majority of you have been reasonable, I would say. So whoever is saying that you want to understand the journey of a data science project, yeah, we will be accomplishing that, uh, you know, effectively communicate uh, and uh, lead the data science team more effectively, learning the jargon on how the project goes. I mean, absolutely. That's our goal, but anybody who is feeling like the first and fourth option, uh, I'm, I think those are a little far away from what we could accomplish in the next one and a half, two hours we have. So, so I hope, I mean, I could communicate, but that's, that's, I think one. So thank you for your responses on that. And then with this, you know, uh, uh, I'll hand it over to Upkar. I think uh, we just wanted to, maybe, I know we shared the uh, instructions on getting your system set up. But I think um, we'll still kind of, you know, walk you through that quickly. So if somebody has not been able to follow along and the recordings would be posted later. So, from, but our goal is that you all try the steps what we are following uh, in this workshop and that's why it's hands on. Uh, so with this, uh, over to you, Kar. Okay, let me share my screen. By the way, I was uh, reading the responses and it's interesting that everybody assumed that the list is one based and not zero based because the programmer in me, the first question I asked was, is this zero, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four? <laughs> but okay, hopefully you can uh, see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. So I think you ended here. All right. So First of all, I, I hope everybody is able to follow along and actually do the workshop with us. So what Neeraj and I did, uh, we, we created another PDF. Actually, let me go to that uh, GitHub repo. This is Git, Neeraj's GitHub repo. So if you go here, first of all, do if you like the workshop, do star it, do fork it. Um, and then there are a couple of different files here. So the, uh, the first, um, thing here is the notebook itself that we want to explore together and, and hopefully you get you get to import that into your Watson Studio environment today as well. Um, but more importantly, there is some setup instructions that we sent beforehand. And if you weren't able to um, do the instructions before, that's fine, you can do them now. Actually, I'll go through the steps real quick here in the next five to seven minutes. And if you watch the screen, it, it's it's pretty easy to follow along. 
Um, and then we also have the actual uh, PDF of the presentation here for you to look at after. Okay, so if, I, if you open the setup instructions, we are going to do a couple of things here. So first is create an IBM Cloud account. We sent, uh, or this PDF has a link um, on page number 12, this one here. So if I, if I open that in a new tab, you'll see I'm already logged in. So it's asking me to log out in order to create a new account. But if you're not logged into your IBM Cloud account, you should be able to use this. And the cool thing about this URL is that you it gives you a special account where you don't have to enter your credit card number. Um, if you were to go to the public cloud.ibm.com um, URL, it would ask you for a credit card, even though everything we use today is free or has a free tier or a light tier, I should say, and it would not charge you anything. So use that URL to create your account. And then we will create three services today. Um, let me see, yes, three. So first is Watson Studio. Second is Watson Machine Learning. And the third is Cloud Object Storage. Okay, so let us let me actually go ahead and start creating those. And as I go through them, I'll explain what you eat, each one of those uh, uh, is for. So I'm already logged into my IBM Cloud account. So cloud.ibm.com takes me to this dashboard. There's a lot to talk about here, so I'm, I'm, you know, we'll let's just start creating the services, and as I go through the pages, I'll explain what they are. Um, dashboard is where you see um, any sort of announcements, um, your resources, what you've used so far, uh, and if you have any tickets open, things like that. It's the overall high-level view of your uh, account on IBM. And then the other um, important uh, page here is the catalog. So if you click on the catalog on the top right. Uh, it'll show you all of the different services that are offered on IBM Cloud, and there's plenty of ways to uh, see them by category. On the left here, you can see, or you can filter them by different uh, things here as well. So you can you know, look at all of the IBM-provided free services, for example. All right, so like I said, we need to create three services today. So the first one is Watson Studio. So I'm going to type that up on the bar here, or you can also use the search the catalog as well. It'll take you to the same thing. So Watson Studio first one, click on that, and you'll see um, in the plan, it'll automatically pick, uh-oh, so let me actually go back and do this again. The problem is I just had all these services created, and I need, so you can have only one free or light tier at a time, um, so I just want to make sure I deleted the ones I created before. I did, okay. Just to be safe, I'm going to log out and log back in. Give me a second. Okay, I do have a lot of different accounts with random emails. So let me log into this one. And we will um, start creating the services again. So, um, not now. All right, so first thing I want to do is Watson Studio. Neeraj, just the screen, uh, is the text okay, or do you want me to enlarge it? I think enlarge will work. And also, I think if you just want to check, I think we can, just wanted to ask, like, uh, how many of you have been able to log in so far so you can follow along with us? If you can post yes on the chat, if you are logged into this website. Okay, a lot of, I see a lot of yeses. That's good. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, so a couple of things to notice here. So first, the light tier is picked for you. Please, you know, um, that, that's enough for our purposes today. Um, and then the second thing to notice the location here. So whatever you pick, whatever location you pick here, that location will be used in two places. One is when we create the other service, we want to create it in the same location as Watson Studio. And the second thing is in the notebook itself, there's a place where we ask you to put in the location of the service, which is this, for me, it is US South. For you, it might look a little bit different. But ensure, make sure that you first take note of this uh, region. And secondly, the next service we create, make sure you create it in the same region as Watson Studio. Okay, so agree to license and terms and then click on create. So this usually takes a couple of seconds. So there you go, it's saying Watson Studio in Cloud Pack for Data has been created. Great. The second service I want to create is machine learning. So type that up on top. 
it's the same process. So machine learning also has a light here, and you also have a pick a have to pick a location. Again, I picked US South for Watson Studio, so I'll pick US South for machine learning as well, and agree to the conditions and create the service. So again, this is the second service we created. And third and the last service we want to create is the cloud object storage. Now, if you have worked with S3 before, this is an S3 compatible cloud object storage or object storage service uh, on IBM Cloud. When you create this, it will not ask you to uh, pick a region because this is the cloud object storage is cross region. Um, when you create, when you actually create a bucket inside the service, then it might, uh, or then it asks you to pick a uh, region. But we don't have to do that for our um, workshop today. So pick IBM Cloud, and Light Tier is selected again. Uh, by the way, in all of these services, I'm picking the default name. You can rename your service if you like, and then click on Create. So again, just to uh, reiterate, three services: Watson Studio, Watson Machine Learning in cloud object storage. And you can let us know in chat if uh, once you have created all three or if you run into problems. All right, this should come up pretty soon here. Go back to chat. It's taking a little bit longer to provision here. So let me open another tab and go back to my cloud.ibm.com. I want to show you something else while that comes up. So if you ever get lost in you know, one of the many pages on this uh, cloud dashboard, uh, the one thing, the navigation on menu on the left-hand side is pretty handy. And there's something called resource list. So if I click on that, you'll see it shows me all of the resources that I've created on, uh, in my account. So, and then if I uh, further drill down into software and services, you'll see this is the machine learning service I just created. This is the Watson Studio service I just created. And finally, this is the cloud object storage service, which has been provisioned now uh, that I created. Okay, so step the next step, once you have created these services is to um, open Watson Studio. So let's click on Watson Studio and let's launch it. So launch in Cloud Pack for Data. Once this finishes, we will create a project. So everything in Watson Studio is driven by projects. Um, so you can, on the main page, you can see I don't have any projects yet because I just created the service. So let me click on new project. Uh, all of these steps, by the way, have screenshots in the PDF. So if you're not, if you're, if I'm going too fast, you can always go back to the PDF and follow along. So on this page, I'll uh, pick create an empty project. We have to give it a name. So let's call this, I'm gonna call it workshop. You can call yours, whatever you want. And you can see it already picked the cloud object storage that I had created earlier in the previous step. Um, and so if you forget to create that, or if you don't have one, this screen will give you a way to create a, a new cloud object storage instance. But it's easier to create the services beforehand and then create a new project in Watson Studio. All right, so it's creating a new project. And the next step after doing that would be to associate my Watson machine learning service with my project. So all of the notebooks in my project can use that service to um, create and, and deploy models. Okay, within this project, so now I've created this project. Within this project, there's a couple of different tabs, right? Overview is the overview of your project. Um, and then the assets is what we are interested in. So you can add different kinds of assets to the project. You can load different kinds of files, for example, CSV data files uh, and other kinds of files. All of those files would get stored in cloud object storage. You can see on the, on the right-hand side here. But there are other things you can add as well. So this add to project will tell you all the things you can add into your project. We will come back to this and add the notebook that Neeraj and I have written for you in this project. Before we do that, let's add the machine learning service. So to, in order to do so, let me enlarge this a little bit. You go to settings, and there is a section called associated services. Currently it's empty. And you say add a service, and Watson, 
and it should list my machine learning service that was created earlier here. If you don't see this, ensure that you have the correct filter selected on top, right? So it might be that you don't have the area that you picked before selected here, so you won't see anything. And this is where it's important that your machine learning service be in the same region as your Watson Studio service. So I'm gonna click on associate service. So that's done. So now I have my machine learning service or my Watson Studio knows about my machine learning service and that's important. And you'll see once you're done, you'll see it listed here as well. All right, so now we have, we have done all the prep work. We've got three services here and we have linked Watson Studio with machine learning. We have a project in Watson Studio. Now we will add the notebook as an asset uh, to our project. So again, if um, uh, currently there are no assets here, you can see. I'm going to click on add to project and then add a notebook. Now there are different ways to add a notebook. You can start off with a blank notebook, of course. You can get a notebook from file on local disk. We'll use this third option to get the notebook from the GitHub repository that uh, Neeraj has prepared for us. So again, if I go back to um, this. In the chat, actually, yeah. Oh, you added in the chat? Let me actually grab it from there as well. Ah. Okay, this is not working. Let me get, <laughs> I'm just gonna get it from, uh, from here. But it's the same URL. Here we go. So this one here, I'm going to copy link address and I will paste it. So the name of the notebook is NPS and you can name it whatever you want. And then instead in this remote, in this notebook URL, I'm gonna put in the whole URL that Neeraj posted in the chat. You can leave the runtime as default. Um, of course, there are other paid options as well if you need more juice and more power to run your notebooks. Uh, and there's, as this thing says at the bottom right, there's GPU enabled notebooks available as well. But for us, the free runtime that they provide us is, is good enough. That's it, let's say create. And it should import the notebook from GitHub into Watson Studio as an asset in my project. So once that's done, I think I'll pass it back to Neeraj once this finishes and we can get along with the agenda. All right, let me also go back here. So yeah, so we went through <clears throat> setting up our environment, creating the services, creating a project, then we added a notebook. Our URL is also here, by the way. And yeah, those are the steps I wanted to do. Let's go back and there we go. So the notebook has been um, imported into my environment. You can see it's using Python 3.8 runtime here. If you've used Jupyter Notebooks before, um, this is a you know it's a typical Jupyter Notebook. But if, if you haven't, these things are called cells and there's a couple of different ways to run it. And there's a couple of different things you can put in a cell. So this, the first cell contains Markdown as you can see here. And to run it, you can either use this button. So if I click on run, it runs that cell. There's nothing to run since it's a markdown. Or you can press shift enter to run it if you like to use the keyboard, okay? And one more thing to notice, once you get to the code, you'll see uh, to, to begin with, oh, actually mine doesn't have, mine, all of mine has numbers already in them. But um, these numbers, once you run them, or as the cells are running, this thing changes to a star, as you can see. So if you see a star, it just means there's something happening. The cell is being processed. And once it's done, it'll change to a number. And the numbers are sequential. So you know, if I run one, two, three, three cells, and then I go back to the first cell and run it again, you'll see a four there. So don't, don't get confused with that if uh, this is the first time you're using Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, Neeraj, is there anything else we wanna cover at this point? I think, I, think the, I think the IAM credentials, I think that's one more. Okay, good, thank you for reminding me. So um, as I said before, we are using Watson Machine Learning in order to train, or not to train our model, but in order to deploy our model. We're using scikit-learn to train our model. And we're using Watson Machine Learning to deploy our model um, online as a service so that somebody can use it with uh, uh, REST endpoints. In order to use Watson Machine Learning, somewhere down in this notebook, I won't go there now, but you need uh, uh, credentials, you need an API key. 
to grab that API key, again, the screenshots in the PDF document will explain this as well. But let me show you real quick how to do it. I'm gonna close this. So to grab that um, on your IBM Cloud screen or the console screen, you go to Manage and then you go to IAM Access. This used to be done differently, by the way, if you've attended this workshop before, uh, they've changed it to use IAM credentials for all of the services on uh, in your account. And what you do is once you manage IAM and then you click on API keys. And you can see I generated this earlier this morning, but you can generate a new one. Um, we'll, so you cannot use an existing key because once you generate a key, it hides the value from you. So that's the other thing. So let's let, let me let me show you. So once uh, click on this button to generate a new key, and I'll say workshop key, and I'll say create. So this is the key here. I'm going to show it to you because I'm going to delete it later. But do not share your private keys with, with anybody else. Uh, but once I get out of the screen, this key is gone. So what we do is click on download and save that somewhere on your desktop so you can go back to it later. But make note of this key. So in the notebook, once we are going through it, you will see it'll ask you for this key later on in order to use, use the machine learning service with the SDKs. All right, Neeraj, back to you. Thank you. Hey. So with this, I think we have uh, we have a short five or ten minutes break, but I think yeah, we would stay over here on the bridge. I think just to see uh, if you all are set up or if you're facing any difficulty, we can just uh, help you with the steps further on. But uh, so yeah, so the break starts. I mean, yeah, we'll be back in another. Uh, I mean, uh, ten minutes from now, and uh, get started on next steps. But we are here. If you have anybody have, have any questions, uh, so yeah, is that okay, Sukar? Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. Thank you. And yeah, if you all set up, I think, and if you have this notebook open uh, in your computers, if you're still around, if you can give some yeses that you're ready, uh, that'll really help us to know that you're following along. Uh, so Tim, which step you got confused in, if you want to elaborate that, or you want to come on audio, or either chat is okay, whatever you prefer, you want to talk more about that, so we can, uh, I can try helping you out on that. Okay, associate services. Okay, I'll show you that step. Okay, one second. So, yeah, I'm going to share my screen and uh, share the step. Yeah. yeah, if you can see my screen and uh, like you're already there in Watson Studio, I think so. This is the step like uh, uh, I think what Ukar shared is like uh, then you are in the project. So, these are the projects, and I'm assuming uh, in the projects you have already created a project. I mean, I created one. Uh, with the name NPS. So once you have the project and then you look at these option overview assets environments jobs access and you click on settings. And once you click on settings and scroll further down. Uh, I've already done that, but I mean, uh, what you will have to do here is click on add services. Uh, then click on uh, Watson. And then uh, you will find here uh, Watson service. Just put a tick mark on that. And then just say associate uh, kind of there'll be an option here. You can just associate that. Uh, does that help? Are you able to follow along? Awesome. Thank you for the confirmation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to I mean send to all because I'm sure if many may have questions, similar questions, so that may help others also. But it's your preference. That's all fine. Any other questions anyone has or uh, need some help? Please call out. So the way to verify you all are, I mean, good to go would be, I mean, if you go to settings, uh, then basically you will have Watson machine learning here. And then if you go to uh, resources, then basically you will find out that, you know, uh, basically, I mean, you have, if you looked at the last one when we created, if you looked at the resources, you will find WML object storage and the Watson studio three services in the resources. Uh, yes, Tripti. So once you have the API key, just save it somewhere. And uh, once we will go through the notebook, there is going to be a place where we have to paste that uh, API key. So just store it for now, and we are going to use that. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. After creating the services, okay. So uh, okay. So once you have uh, created the services, uh, were you able to create the API keys? 
Okay, so the next step after that would be creating an API key. So let me just share my screen one second. Uh, if you see my screen, so I think first thing you'll have to see is when you go to the resources. So if you go to this link, I just pull, I mean, the way to verify that you have everything set up is that uh, one, you look at the, let me open the chat, I'll post the link side by side. So you go to resources and then you verify that you have three services. One, you have object storage. If you don't have, you can add it. And second, uh, you have uh, two more services, which is machine learning and Watson Studio. So you already have these three services, right? Uh, they're showing up in resources. Okay, cool. So once you have that, then you go to manage on the top and then click on uh, access uh, IAM here. And once you do that, then on the left, there is an option that says uh, API keys. And here you click on create uh, an IBM cloud API key and just save that because we are gonna use that later. And uh, once you have done that, so it will show something like this, but you can save that uh, in your system. Done, okay, so once you have done that, go back to the resources. And then once you're on the resources, where it says uh, Watson Studio, open this, open Watson Studio in the resources. So once you'll open the Watson Studio, then it says launch in IBM Cloud Pack for data. And it's gonna open up. And uh, are you with me so far? And once you have that, then you have to create a project. It says uh, create a project. So you can uh, click on create a project. Uh, if you're on this screen with me so far. Okay, cool. So then click on create a project and uh, this screen will open for you. And you can click on create an empty project. And once you have done that, then you can uh, put a name, you know, like uh, any name, like I would say NPS uh, workshop. And once you have done that, you'll see an object storage which will, which will automatically, you know, uh, get aligned here. And then click on create. Niraj, you could also remind people if they have questions or need help, they can raise their hand. It's that uh, down oh, yeah. at the bottom. Absolutely. the smiley face. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. You all can use that also, yeah. There's a Q and A or raising a hand, yeah. So once after you're done, thank you uh, for that reminder. I'm trying to add a Watson service, it's not allowing me. I can see the listed, but I can associate it to the project. Okay, I think so the problem here uh, would be, uh, Judy, that I think, let's finish this one. I'll tell you what I think is going on with that. I think I know that. So once you're done creating the project, and I think uh, I'm gonna start the session now, I think because uh, uh, I think hopefully you're able to follow along until here. So once you create a new project, then basically uh, you'll see and you'll see a project coming here. And uh, so I have a new project here, like I just created. And uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then once you have a new project, then you click on uh, add a project and then click on uh, notebook. And then, uh, and when you do the notebook, you click on from URL. And then, uh, you know, you can uh, from URL, just type the name of the, you know, notebook at NPS or something, NPS workshop notebook. And then you can just put the URL, which I shared in the chat uh, over here. And then click on create. And once you do that, you will be uh, on the page, pretty much on this page, which will open the notebook. Okay. So awesome. Thank you. Are you able to follow along so far? Are you good? Okay, great. So let's get started. I know we are pretty much uh, on time and thank you for uh, following along. So I think let's get started back on the workshop. So, and where can I find the project? Where can I find the project? I think so project is you have to create a blank project. 
and then the notebook link is pasted on this chat. So when you create a new notebook, uh, that's when you will find that. So basically, uh, the project when you created, you created a blank project, like pretty much you can create an empty project. And then within that, you had to open a notebook, like uh, from there. So uh, let's get awesome. Thank you, Dipin. Okay, so let's get started now. And uh, so, I mean, so what we have done so far, I mean, just re uh, kind of a recapping on that. I mean, if for now it's just been like a few clicks and you have your infrastructure ready for like any machine learning project end to end. If we all would have done it like standalone, it would have taken ages. So we, so what we have accomplished so far, and uh, thank you, Carl, for that. So we have set up like the machine learning, uh, you know, in our uh, infrastructure, uh, the virtual infrastructure we have. Uh, we have set up the storage, object storage. Uh, we have the Watson Studio in which we have a notebook uh, that we will be using, Python notebooks, and we also have our credentials API, uh, which can be used centrally to authenticate that we already have set up. So how so now again if we are moving on to the next step how does how does these projects go on I mean and how does it and there are a lot of times I mean I've been in uh, some other conferences on some you know some uh, speaker series and some mentoring a lot of people would ask you know how do I know I don't have a project I love data science I've heard a lot about it I don't have a problem statement to work on so I just wanted to share the journey that we took so in our scenario like you know one one of the days I think like uh, uh, this whole case study is inspired from some of the work I have been doing with the business uh, and so we were with our CIO um, and you know I was sitting with them and like we called upon like a, a working session with our leadership and then uh, CIO mentioned about you know the kind of you know kind of in, in this example a great concerns with client satisfaction because we always want to be the best and then the CEO CMO kind of brought up a point that hey I mean it's always you know customers give their money fan gives their heart so we really need their hearts is what we should aim for and then CFO brought up another financial point there that, you know, hey, I mean, rather than, you know, customer retention is more important, you know, for us to decrease the cost. So we, that's very, very important. And then the, then the, you know, operate, you know, CEO mentioned about yeah, that, you know, currently in this example, or I mean, if we would see uh, like 44% of the customers for this, uh, you know, for this uh, kind of, you know, case study, 44% uh, of the customer experience has been bland. And and then I think uh, kind of, let's say, I was also part of the conversation. I brought up a point that when we talk about customer experience, NPS is an industry standard to measure the customer experience. And the point I brought up was that, how about we use NPS uh, as a measure for satisfaction and we see how we can further improve upon that. And then possibly what we could do, uh, you know, and then we could actually start predicting the customer experience ahead of time and bringing in the right intervention is the case study that we kind of you know coined in that conversation and the cio was like okay right so you all are a team right now and let's assume this in this workshop we all are like the member of that the core team and we all are asked to go back and build a proof of concept to predict the nps net promoter score which which equates to customer experience so that's how this whole project or any of the case studies get started you know there is a sponsor there are some support management and then you start building your team and I have a, like, you know, how many, I mean, 60, 80 people out there as my extended team here to build the proof of concept together, you know, uh, out here. And then, so basically, I mean, and, and that's where, if you remember, we looked at the whole, uh, you know, the structure of a project, like a framework. So when we, anytime we start a project, we assess the situation. What is the situation currently? So let's say this is the company and they support 500 cases or 500 interactions uh, on multiple platforms with the customer. And uh, then their response rate, I mean, if you send them a survey, the response rate was 15% and 60% um, and of the responses were non-promoters and 40 were promoters. And in this example, you can see that, you know, the scale is zero to 10 and we combine like the detractor and passive into one as not happy because if it's passive also, we consider them not happy and, uh, you know, and then the promoter is like a positive. They're like very happy about what, you know, the services they're getting from us. So this was like assessing the situation and any of the problem that we generally get into, we have to see the scale of the problem. How big problem are we solving And a page like this, being able to, you know, fill in the blanks and these numbers is always very helpful in this situation. But then once we know what, I mean, NPS, I mean, some for some of you, NPS might be very new kind of terminology. So it's always important to be able to put a documentation on how it is calculated and in this example we all have experienced it i'm sure about that because we all get a question at the end of our 
interactions with any chatbot, any of the customer service departments from any company, like the question on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend the company to a friend or colleague? And there's a scale of zero to 10, and you can see how it's, you know, these ratings at a, at an aggregate level, how the upper kind of, you know, goes down further down. So let's say there are thousand total responses. You can see how many promoter, how many passive, how many detractors, and the final formula of calculating uh, NPS is, uh, you know, detractor uh, minus uh, the promoter, and this score can can be like minus 100 to plus 100. And like in this example, the score is 10. That's how the NPS is calculated. And I've also kind of incorporated or rather included the link of the calculator also for your reference. So now once we assess the situation, we know the methodology. It's also very important, like I mentioned in the earlier you know, scenario, that we need to look for some poster childs around like or industry standards. Like, is there somebody who has done that? I mean, what is it? If they can do it, why can't we do that? I mean, it's, if it's I mean, something we are missing out. So you look at benchmarks, and in this example, you can see the left chart talks about the industry benchmarks on which industry has what NPS score, like on a scale of minus 100 to plus 100. Then on the right side, you can see the top, I mean, some of the poster childs on uh, uh, NPS, like Southwest, uh, you know, one of my favorite, and then uh, Apple, and all of them are like premium on the customer service out there. And you can see they are the poster child out there. Uh, so they, this is possible. So if you have to set a benchmark or a target for us, this can be referred as one of the baseline, uh, you know, in the context. Now, once we have done that, then the next step comes, be, be able to articulate kind of, you know, your goal, approach and desired results. So in our scenario, we say we want to improve the NPS uh, by identifying the potential non-promoters non -promoters ahead of time and proact be proactive in addressing their custom their issues as such. And then approaches, we consume the historical data. Uh, we use uh, ML and AI, uh, set up an algorithm, and uh, we, we use that to predict the cases which are worked upon uh, so that we know ahead of time where they're gonna rate us down and address their issues more proactively. Uh, because we're talking about large volumes and it's not possible to look at every one of them as you know proactively if they are really not happy with the service. Now, and then finally, you know, bring the UI or the tool which can be made available to the customer, to the to the team, so they can they can consume these predictions as such. So this was the business objective. Now I think with this, I think uh, like I said, it's a hands-on, and I think by the end of this workshop, uh, what we aim for is that you go with the problem statement where you use this template and start filling it up, and maybe build a project, start making more partnerships. So. One of the exercise I think I would like to request here, if you all can put your inputs on the chat. So this is the template. I mean, you can say that as a role, I mean, your role could be an end user, could be a developer or a CIO, CTO, or the CEO, or, or I mean, any full stack developer. I mean, anything, any work you're doing, that's your role. I would like to, I mean, improve, reduce, increase, decrease. I mean, like in this case, we are increasing the uh, NPS, you know, the target variable for me, the target variable is NPS, like customer satisfaction for you. It could be fraud, risk, you know, F, you know, kind of effort, price, anything. I mean, out of the list, productivity or revenue, you know, and then for department X or a scope of area you focus on by an amount, which could be a value or a percentage uh, in the time frame within three months, two weeks, a year, next one year. I mean, you can mention that. Think about it and then kind of, you know, list down your thoughts on the chat so that people can see some variety on what are the possibilities and how the problems can vary based on all of your experiences together. So it'll take like a two minutes. And if you want to think through it, uh, this template and share some of the examples in the chat, that would greatly help. Because I'm sure when you signed up for the workshop, you all have a problem, kind of something that you are looking around and you're saying, hey, this is a problem, I can solve it. So this is the time, you know, you can anonymize or simplify the problem, but if you are comfortable, please share in the chat so we all can look at that. And Maureen and Upkar, is, is this something you wanted to add up to this one? Not just yet. I'll watch the chat. Okay.
Okay, I think while you're thinking through more examples, I think the goal is that you all have, I mean, your own problem statement that you use uh, this uh, workshop as a medium and apply that. So we'll just give another minute and then I think uh, we'll move on to the hands-on part. Anyone else still thinking? Wearing your creative hats on what problems you want to solve in your business? To increase the NPS for customers ad by 10%. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. I think thank you for these inputs. And I mean, I keep posting, I mean, so that everybody can see some of what different kind of problems can come in. Like if you are doing some testing, you want to reduce the you know test bugs, or if you're working in the manufacturing unit, they could be, I mean, tons of examples, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, so I think yeah. So, so keep thinking about the problems and uh, keep posting them so everybody can see that. So I think so. Moving on from here, I mean, this is like a very good reference template for all of us to start documenting the opportunity to, to begin with. And once we have done that, so I mean, and and so far, if you see, like you know, what we've been able to accomplish. I mean, we've been able to have a structure where we can assess the situation, understand methodology, benchmarks. And hopefully you have a structure on being able to define a business objective on the problem you're trying to solve. Now, the next part here is that, uh, you know, we start looking at the data. So once we are done with the first phase of the project, which is a business understanding, uh, then the next part comes as, uh, so where is the data? I mean, what are we gonna use to train an algorithm and, and how do we get started? And that's where features plays a very important role. So in our work that we are doing right now in this workshop, we looked at multiple features like time based features, uh, location based features, uh, the money based or the sentiment and emotions. Time based could be, you know, what day of the week they call us, they call on weekend or the working, what time window do they call us in prime hours or non prime hours, like off hours, something really must be troubling them. That's why they're calling off hours uh, based on the time zone. How, what's the age of an account? I mean, how many meaningful updates are they kind of having? And then what's the location? I mean, which location are they calling us from? Uh, what's a spend like a lifetime spend recurring spend and I mean and, and each conversation they are having with us uh, how are their sentiments uh, emotions like a Twitter example uh, Maureen took so in this is like real time then they're then they're chat when they are putting up the case updates in the cases uh, we can calculate the sentiments emotions and detect whether what direction this whole case is going to and then there are many many other features like you know how many times this case has been assigned from one team to another if the assignment has been five six ten that's a problem. I mean, nobody is taking an ownership and what support plan, what account type, severity. I mean, many, many other options could be there. So this is the kind of data that we looked at in our scenario. And then, you know, we looked at, and, and then the point here is as soon as you have the data, the next very important thing is start looking at the quality of the data. Is the data re really reliable? And the reliable as a definition could be taken from multiple, uh, multiple ways. Like for example, uh, you know, you look at how many numbers of observations are there? Is there enough data for me to look at? You know, are there too many values in a column? If there are, then I mean, because at the end of the day, we are trying to train an algorithm with some patterns. And if every row has a different value, this is very hard to build a machine learning model. So we need to bucket them or find some creative ways to look at that. If there are heavy correlations, you know, kind of we look at that, which file, which of the which of the fields that have a correlation which one we can keep, which one we should drop if they are representing the same information. If there is a missing value, I mean, too many missing values, do we impute them? Do we just let go of those records? And the end goal is that we have a data that we can rely and as best as we can get out of, you know, of the information we have received. And then uh, basically with this step, we, if we all have the notebooks open, so we will open the, uh, you know, the notebook out here. So, so this is, the notebook and now i think the work goes on more hands-on with the context of we have a business problem we have the data and now we want to understand the data better so if you look at that uh Upkar already talked about like you know basics of notebook as such here you know so if you want to run this uh we just click on the first cell and run this is a markdown so you'll not see anything as such but it's just an information to document and so you all can follow along this is an index of the notebook. I mean, generally that's a practice we follow to structure the notebook in a better way. And then uh, we, this talks about the notebook. And then 
loading the packages and verifying the version. I mean, in Python, loading the package is more like, you know, if you look at the home scenario, we have appliances, you know, we have microwave, washer, dryer. So in the same example of Python ecosystem, we have libraries that we can call upon and they, everything does their own job. So there's a visualization library, there's a machine learning library, just like we want to heat the food, we go to microwave and say heat the food. The same way Python ecosystem, there are libraries that we need to initiate and, and that way we can avoid writing thousands of lines of code. And that's the kind of an analogy and, and we are doing in the step two, where we are loading the libraries uh, that we are going to use in this project. So just select the cell and then click on run. And then uh, you can just click on uh, check versions over here in this step. And then we have to load the file because we have to read the file, uh, the data that's been made available to us or we created. So this step, uh, we are just reading the data directly from the GitHub. And we are reading that and uh, displaying that. So you have, you have to select the cell and then click on run. And uh, once you have done that, uh, there is a visualization package. There are two of them. Uh, one is a data prep, another is a pandas profile. So you can run this one. And, uh, you know, this one. And it takes a little while, yeah, because it's installing. So once you have that, then basically how it will look like, I can show you in this example. You know, let me show you this one. So once you run that, this is what will come up. Basically, you will have, uh, you know, this is the output, how it will come up. So you will have the statistics just with one line of command over here. You will be able to kind of inspect your entire data set. So you can see that, you know, this is a data set. It has 58 variables. Uh, these many rows, missing cells, how many missing cells out there, how many are duplicate rows, and all the information, how many are categorical, numerical, and, you know, uh, geography-related data. And you can see a lot more information out there. And, you know, further you can start inspecting the data. Now, you can also see the histograms or kind of, you know, distributions of the data, you know, overall for all of them. For example, you know, what is what is the support tier representation in this? Like, you can see a support plan. Majority of them belong to support tier, and then it goes further down to support three. So maybe it's support three must be a premium for the user, and there are fewer out there. That's the one way to learn it. Then the severity of the case. You can see that most of the cases are in severity four, and very few in three, two, and one. So that means this is a common severity, and it goes in the order of one being the, the most urgent issues and all that. So you can just inspect your data, just looking at, just with a one line of command, you can pretty much see your entire data, and wherever you find some problems, you know, like, okay, you can see the prime time, non-prime time, a lot of information, a lot of information. And then, you know, whether the severity was, has been changed, you know, during the course of when we are helping the customer. And there are a lot of information. I mean, this is an endless, and you can see sentiments, like uh, in this sentiment overall, you can see, like, it's on a scale of minus one to plus one. So you can see these all uh, customer comments have been classified as sentiments out here. So you can see that, I mean, they're definitely, so there are multiple variables like I showed you in the last slide, and that is how we would look at or inspect the data. And if something looks wrong, that's the time we should start questioning the data and going back to the, you know, the data engineering team or the provider. And then this also talks about the correlation uh, and our, you know, the, the NPS is the one we are looking at as a final variable. We are making, we are trying to make a prediction and across all the other data points we have captured, what is the correlation of that with the uh, with the target uh, or outcome we are looking at? So that's that's one way of looking at that. And then uh, there's also another one which is pandas. It generally takes a little while. Uh, if you want, you can run it, but generally takes a little while. So I generally leave it. But the outputs are very interesting uh, from this also. Uh, but you should try this out uh, later. I would say, uh, like for example, uh, so when you go to the like uh, pandas, uh, this is the EDA uh, prep, the one we looked at just now. Uh, and when you look at pandas, it's pretty similar, but I mean, the views are again different. Like it also tells you a similar information. I put the snapshot on the presentation. Then it tells you some warnings about cardinality, very distinct values and you know, all that. And this is, this is one of my favorite chart. It also helps you to visualize all the missing values across all the columns and that tells you how much data is populated. So this chart is very interesting. In one snapshot, you can see uh, which columns needs to be filled up or they are partial, and you can then be focused on working on the information. 
so that's how it is and then i think uh, then i think that hopefully i think you are able to uh, try these steps can i get few yeses if you are able to run these two uh, on your computer anyone been able to run it so far awesome thank you thank you very much and then i think that brings to the next part of the workshop where i think like as you've been able to follow along put your problem statement and then the next part here is that given i got my data set for the project and the workshop we have and the project we are working on for this stakeholder but if you're working with another stakeholder and the problem statement you have selected is sign that we should start thinking about what data set would you gather for this problem statement and make your own notes uh, so that by the end of the workshop hopefully you have a charter that you can start working on you know with your business and start having a similar project if that helps your business with the outcomes so with this i think uh, uh, and i think so far i think what we accomplished uh, as in we've been able to uh, have a you know, uh, some introduction to notebook. We were able to load the packages, verify the version, explore the data set and perform a quick quality check on our data. And with this, Upkar, I'll hand it over to you. That's okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, let me, give me one second. I'm running all the cells that you already ran so we can pick it up from where you left off. Sure, sure. Okay. So, almost Pardon? there. Yeah. yeah. If you have it. Keep asking, yeah. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. See my screen? Yes. All right, so um, what I did here was, so, so as Neeraj uh, took us through, I think section three, and one way to quickly run all the cells is you can go to cell menu and run all above. So if you if you you know if if you haven't been running them one by one, this is another way to do it. So you can see it's running, it's ran number five, and there's a star which means it's processing that cell right now. So let me go back to the PowerPoint, and hopefully by the time we come back to this, it would have finished running. All right, so. The notebook, there's there's a lot of sales in the notebook, and you know you can you can see it's a pretty long notebook. Um, but there are a couple of things that I I would like to point out that we had to do in order to um, clean up the data and make sure it's ready for con the con or ready to create the model, uh, and then uh, also ready to be consumed by the model. So, Neeraj mentioned mentioned the different kinds of data that that we have in this data set, and uh, there, there's a concept called feature extraction, part of which is looking at um, categorical values. So if I go back to, uh, you know, Neeraj showed you this, this diagram, but um, let's look at uh, severity, right? So severity in this case, that's just one of the categorical columns we have. And you can see it's, uh, <clears throat> the values are tier one, tier two, three, tier three, and tier four. So it's a um, versus a um, continuous value. This is a categorical value. Now the problem is the models you create do not understand categorical value, values like this, right? They only understand numerical values. So there are different techniques in order to convert these categorical values into something that the model can use to uh, build, or, or or the framework can use to build a better model. What we use is something called one-hot encoding, and Essentially what that is, is you take the actual values of the column and convert the values into additional columns. So for example, in this case, support tier one, two, three, and four would become columns. And for every row, you would have a zero or a one indicating if these categories are absent or present. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. That's the one we used and scikit-learn uh, has a nice function or a method to help us do that. There are other techniques as well. And uh, Neeraj uh, has put some links at the bottom of the slide for you to go read up on, on these. Uh, I think each one of these can probably take a lecture to explain and, and, and go through in detail. So we'll leave that for now. But uh, for example, uh, a hashing encoder is the other one. Uh, as you can imagine, right, we have just four columns here, and, or sorry, four categories here. So we get, when one hot encoding, we get four additional columns. If you can imagine, if you have a lot of uh, categories in your um, data or in your values, then you would get hundreds and thousands of columns. And that's, you know, th that'll make for a very big data set and cause more problems. So there's something called a uh, hashing encoder that deals with that. So we use that for one of the columns. 
uh, as well, and I'll show you in a second. Then there's label encoder, uh, which essentially um, would label these as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 0, 1, 2, 3 in this case. Uh, and then instead of creating columns, each row would have 0, 1, 2, 3, indicating what kind of tier um, the value has or the data has. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is you know when you say 0, 1, 2, 3, the model might give more value to something which is labeled four versus something which is labeled one, right? So there's, again, uh, you have to kind of go through this, understand your data, and then pick the uh, feature extraction uh, for the categorical type that makes most sense for your data. Same thing with feature scaling, right? An example I give with this is, let's say you're predicting, uh, taking a different example, you're predicting a price of a house based on a number of different features or attributes like um, number of bathrooms in the house or, may, or and the square footage of the house. As you can imagine, both of those things might affect the uh, price of the house that you're predicting. Now, in that case, the ranges are quite different. So the number of bathrooms in the house might range from maybe one to four, let's say, but the square footage might go from you know, 400 square feet to maybe 2,000 square feet. Um, and the model might learn different things or might give different weightage to um, the different uh, columns based on how big they are or how small they are, just the numerical value. So to get around that, we do something called feature scaling. And again, there are different techniques to do that. We use something called min-max scalar, where we normalize this data. So uh, the model doesn't prefer one column over another. And the third thing we, we demonstrated in the notebook is called feature selection, or uh, also called dimensionality reduction. So as you can imagine, after this feature extraction a bit, there might be, you know, you might end up with hundreds of thousands of columns or input features or attributes to your model. And, um, you know, that might be too big for the model or it might take too much time for the model to train on. Or more importantly, a number of features um, or different features might not, or con might contribute in the same way to the prediction. And, that is, is sort of duplication, right? So, so what I mean, uh, or sorry, what we do in this notebook is we use um, correlation as a, um, a correlation as a way to see how my input features uh, are correlated with my target variable, and then if they are highly highly correlated, that means they are not telling the input feature is not telling me as much about the target variable as other input features, and we take them out. That's just just an example of how we use correlation to reduce the number of features that are used to train the model. Now, again, there's there's a lot here to discuss and, and you can look at the links at the bottom to get into details into each one of these things. But just wanted to point out, there are cells in the notebook that perform each of these functions. And actually, let me go back to the notebook and see if I can run these. So the first thing we do in section four is uh, identify the columns that are numerical which are you know, numerical columns, good to go. And then we have columns that are categorical on which we'll do the one hot encoding. And then there are columns that are highly categorical in which we'll do the hash encoding. So I run that cell. Um, oops, let me, I added this later on, so let me delete that. Okay, so in here is where we actually do the one hot encoding using this method called get dummies. And then we also do hash encoding uh, in here by applying this hash. So if at this point, if I were to look at NPS select and just look at the columns, you'll see now it's got all these different columns, like the, this, the tribe level underscore two, all of these are the one uh, columns created due by the one hot encoding method that we used here. Uh, similarly, then we start doing feature scaling. As I said, we are using the min max scaler so that's what's happening here. And now you can see all of the values in the different columns range from zero to one. So all the data has been normalized um, for better predictions or creating better models. And lastly here, we use the correlation method as, a, as I explained before, and we pick the top 30 features based on the correlation coefficient that comes back from this utility method that we created. So Again, feature uh, extraction, which is dealing with categorical variables, feature scaling, which is normalizing our data, and then using correlation in this case to, to um, 
to do dimensionality reduction uh, and pick the top 30 features for to create our model. All right, let me go back. I think Neeraj has a quiz for all of you. Neeraj, do you, do you want to explain what's going on here? It's no longer a quiz. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. Um, no. I get the answer on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. So. It's, I mean, right. I know it sounds very often on why ABC, XYZ. I mean, I always never thought about it, but I was like, I mean, one day I was thinking, I mean, who coined ABC and why not, you know, EFG? But I think this just comes from 1637 in La uh, Geometry, you know, so that's where it came from on the, on why we use these alphabets for the purpose they are. So that's pretty much, yeah. Thanks, Upkar. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> no, it's all okay. And there's one more, I think, right? Yeah, and that'll also have the answer. So I, I'm a big yeah, Linux yeah. fan, and I use Linux. And um, <laughs> the slides, the slides didn't show up nicely in the open source version of PowerPoint on Linux. So I, I'm using the PDF version. Yeah, that's okay. So I think another, another one that comes up very often that I think not many people would know. We use it every day. Uh, you know, when you are actually, uh, you know, you are. So when you are looking at the input variable, you use an upper X. And the target variable as you know small case y i mean why it's the case it's again kind of you know there's a there's a whole background on that i mean it's like a, being a vector versus a matrix and uh, so that's the kind of you know explanation on that it comes from linear algebra and i mean if somebody asks you why we use capital x small y it's just the why how the denote you know uh, how we uh, denote the terms in linear algebra uh, and uh, you know response vector being you know, being a Y uh, and it's a vector and the other one is a matrix with multiple columns. So that's the reason we would have capital X and small Y when we train the model test split. I mean, I was always like, why are we using small Y? Why can't it be common like in plain English? But there is a reason behind that. So yeah, over to you, Kar. Maybe X just has a huge ego and Y is very humble. <laughs> yeah. All right, so with that, I think the sections four, five and six, you should be able to run uh, the cells in the notebook. And the whole idea behind this is instead of having you write the code to do this, um, I think with notebooks, it's a lot easier to run that existing code and explore as you go along, right? So for example, when I added uh, that one line to see the different columns, right? So m feel free to add cells as you go along and um, uh, run them to see what happens. So. I think the whole this whole process is, is supposed to be really iterative and uh, experimental and exploratory. All right, Neeraj, back to you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So with this one, uh... okay. Cool. I'll share my screen. So I think so what we have <clears throat> been accomplishing, I mean, we have come a long way. So, I mean, a great job, all of you, I think. And so what we've been able to now extract, scale, select the features uh, from a data model, and we've been able to make, you know, make move one more step forward in this one. Now, I think this also comes as we are heading towards the, uh, you know, the next step of uh, training and mod training a model. So there's a way, I mean, I think this is, this comes from a very interesting book. I've actually uh, posted the link below. It's how do you look at, I mean, it's kind of a similar chart we looked at looking at the analytics approach, but maybe a simpler version of that. So when you are having a, you're looking at classical machine learning, it's supervised, you know, or unsupervised. Sorry, uh, Okar, are you saying something? Hi, Neeraj. I, I don't see your screen. It might just be me though. Who is it? One second. One. You saw your screen okay, Neeraj. Okay, that was just me then. Who is it? <laughs> Okay, let me share it again one second. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, it's showing up now. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, this is the last slide. So I was just emphasizing the point on things we have accomplished so far and additional things we learned. And now the next one is about the algorithm selection. And like I was saying, it's pretty similar to the uh, analytics approach we were talking about. And, and how the starting point look at the problem that I'm solving is a supervised, unsupervised. That's a starting point. Now, when I say supervised and I ask a question, am I predicting a category or am I predicting a number? If I'm predicting a category, 
like customer is happy unhappy there is a fraud not a fraud or a threat not a threat risk yes no kind of those kind of classific then it's a classification problem you know in this scenario it is this is the case right now and if it is uh, predicting a number like a house pricing or any of the numbers i think many example we looked at you know uh, out there anytime we are predicting a revenue i mean probably it could fall under a regression one then they are unsupervised where we don't want anything specific as an answer but we want to see the patterns out there and that's where it falls under clustering uh, and then there is a you know there are times we have to reduce the dimension that's another technique or the association this is very common i think i'm sure you all have seen amazon or any website uh, when you buy a product it tells you you may buy this one also because other other folks bought it uh, so i mean that's another example of that association one when you are choosing the right techniques and you want to move forward then there are many many examples out there i mean just for you to relate to it like uh, you know supervised learning classification could be sp spam filtering like spam versus ham fraud detection uh, regression stock price house you know house price clustering customer segmentation uh, dimensionality reduction could be when we are doing topic modeling or a similar document search in the legal context uh, to look for the laws and the association to place products on the shelf what goes with what and you know and also give suggestions on you may buy this also so that's another part of it so with this i think uh Ukkar, over to you Okay, hopefully you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, yes. All right, perfect. So thanks, Neeraj. So the next thing we want to look at is um, how do you evaluate the different models that you come up with, right? You'll see in the notebook as, as when we get back to it. Um, in these projects or in these state cases, you never sort of work with just one model. You always want to benchmark against something and then, and that might be flipping a coin, right? So whatever your benchmark is and then come up with a couple of different models, uh, tweaking the different hyperparameters to see which one comes out the best, right? And there's no one right answer. There are different ways to evaluate your model. F for a um, classification model, which is what we are doing, uh, you want to look at something called confusion matrix, which results in a couple of different metrics. Uh, confusion matrix, I, I say, as the name suggests, it actually is really confusing, and I need to go back and look at the this this chart, for example, to see uh, to 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 uh, remember what's going on here, but the way to read this is you look at the row on top as what your model predicted, and um, the columns um, on the side on the left hand side, so these two, are what actually happened, and what you're trying to figure out or putting numbers against it, this is when the model predicted no for your class. Was it actually no or was it actually yes? And the same thing with when the model predicted yes for the class, was it actually no or was it actually yes? And based on these, and these things called true negative, which means you know model predicted no, no, it was actually no. True positive means model predicted yes or class B and it was actually class B. And then uh, false negative means it was actually uh, class A, but you predicted class B and the uh, false positive is the other way around. It's, as, you can, as you can tell, it's, it does get really confusing. Um, but essentially, you're looking at these metrics that come out of the confusion matrix, um, accuracy, precision, recall, and then the F1 score is, some, is a combination of uh, accuracy and recall. So accuracy is, um, let's see, accuracy is, as it says here, it's a total or a true positive plus true negative divided by the total. And like intuitively, what it's saying is how many, uh, how many of the cases did your model predict correctly out of the total cases? So that's the accuracy. Precision, on the other hand, you can you can say it's of all the classes that we predicted as positive, how many are actually positive, right? Oh, sorry. And then uh, uh, finally, recall is from all the positive classes, how many we predicted correctly. So as you can see, depending on the case you're looking at, you it may be more important to you that you don't have any false negatives or um, sorry false positives, right? For example, if it's a medical case where you're predicting if somebody has cancer or not, um, in that case, maybe it's it's better to um, 
you know, not have somebody slip through the cracks. So not say, oh, this person is negative, whereas they are, they are positive. So again, depending on the case, you look at the confusion matrix and you pick the um, metric here, which is more important to you or which makes more sense to you for that use case. And again, Neeraj just provided some links at the bottom if you want to read more about these things. Um, let's see. Okay, so in, in our case, we went through and created a whole bunch of different models uh, that uh, uh, the, method, the methods to create these models are provided in scikit-learn. As you'll see in the notebook, the, you know, to get to this point to create the models, you have to go clean up your data, or first of all, gather your data, clean up your data. Uh, we did feature extraction, normalization, scaling, and then we did um, dimensionality reduction. And now we are at a point where you can actually create the model. You'll see this step is actually not that bad to actually create the model once you have that data that can be uh, used to create the model. So if I go back to our notebook here, let's run through a couple of different steps here. So you ran through the feature selection. So we have the top 30 uh, attributes or top 30 features that we'll start use to create our model. The next step is to split your test or split your data set into train and test. And the reason to do that is you use the training data to train your model or models. And then you, uh, uh, to, to um, evaluate, you use the test data. And it is crucial and very important that your model never sees the test data in training, right? That would be cheating. So, and there are other concepts here too, like overfitting, underfitting, all of that. We, we don't go into detail here, uh, but let's run this cell here. And it's, it's, uh, it's just splitting the data into training and testing. And we have created a utility function here, calculate metrics that uh, given the, uh, uh, the true, um, training and testing, or sorry, sorry, the true uh, Y, which is the uh, target variable and the predictions. Uh, so this is the actual and prediction. It'll give me that confusion matrix that you saw in the slide. So let's uh, run through that. So now we have this method. And the first thing you see here, I'm importing logistic regression. That was one of the, um, one of the, one of the models you saw here. Oh, am I not sure? I'm sharing, right? I'm sharing, okay. So that was one of the logistic regressions, the first model you see here. So we create a, an instance of that, and then we pass in our train data, or our training features, and um, the target variables to um, create this model. And you'll see this pattern used a lot in scikit-learn. Uh, so you create an object of the model, and then you call this fit method, and fit method essentially is training the model, and then you call this predict method to get res to actually use the model to get a result back. So let's run through all this. So logistic regression, then uh, support vector machine, k neighbor classifier, all these all these different models that are given to us by Scikit-Learn or provided by Scikit-Learn. Again, decision trees uh, and random forest, which is an ensemble of decision trees. Gradient boost classifier, and let's do this last one, last ensemble as well. All right, so you can see once you run through this, uh, all of the the utility method we created gives us back our precision, our recall, our F1 score. With the F1 score, you want that to be as close to one as possible. And then we get our uh, confusion matrix here. And again, to read this, you would go back to this chart, and you can see it's a two by two matrix, and so is this. Right, so, um, and you want this, you want this column to be as high as possible. The true negatives and two positives, you want those to be as high as possible. Um, so you get some information from this, from these cells, but then the next one here kind of puts it all together. So if I run this cell here, you can see there's a chart here which just has the accuracy. So in this case, we have decided that accuracy is the most important criteria for us to evaluate this model. And you can see the Gaussian um, model comes up at the top and followed by logis logistic regression with, I mean, they're, they're so, like the first uh, few are so close here that you, in this case, I might go back to the confusion matrix and look at some of the other metrics and see what, how else I can compare them. All right, let me go back to the charts. I think that ends, yeah, that ends this section. Neeraj, you wanna to talk to this slide a little bit?
Oh, Neeraj, can you hear me? I think maybe we'll cover this after the model is saved. I think this would be pretty much the last step. Okay, gotcha. All right, so let's let's uh, keep going. So, um, all right, let's go back to the notebook and see what's going on next. So now we have a model, right? We have picked a model. I think in this case, let's go down. We just picked the first model. Let's see. Well, let me let me let's let's read through it instead of doing that. All right, so so we pick a model that based on or based on the evaluation evaluation criteria in our case it was accuracy uh, the next step is to now deploy this model on ibm cloud using the watson machine learning service if you remember we had you copy or store that api key somewhere we need that now so i actually have it here i stored it in a file if you remember so i'm going to copy that key and paste it here Okay, so that's easy. And the second thing is we want your uh, we want to, you to add your location here. Now, if you remember, I was in Dallas, and so my location is US South. If you were in London, it would be EU-GB, et cetera. So you have to go, go back to your service, see what location you were in, and put that here. All right, so now I'm going to run the cell. All this is doing is creating this JSON object or a dictionary with the API key and the, and the URL. And um, if if I actually output the URL, oops, uh, let me stop. I can't use stop mutation. This is where I have to see how good my Python skills are. So here, so this is the URL that it created based on the US South that I provided, All right? So the next cell here installs the Watson machine learning service. So that takes a couple of seconds, and once once that's done. I use this API client um, method um, and pass it my credentials to see if I can authenticate successfully. So I don't get any errors, which is a good sign, meaning I did authenticate successfully. If you get an error here, go back and make sure you have the right API key, you have the right location uh, in this cell. So I've authenticated. There's one more step that you have to go back to your um, to Watson Studio to perform. Now I've closed my Watson Studio, which is fine. So let's go back to cloud.ibm.com. And I will go to resources. And this actually might be helpful for those of you who cl also closed it by mistake. So go to resources, service and software, and I'm going to launch Watson Studio. So I get to this page and I'll say launch, again, launch in IBM Cloud. Now you might be in your project, right? So let me open my project. If you remember, this is this is where the whole thing started. We were in our project and we added the notebook. Now what we want to do next is create a deployment space. So if I go back to the notebook, you'll see here, create a new deployment space. There is a link here. I could have gone directly to this link to create it. I want to show you how to get to it from the project. So if you're already in your project, Click that menu and you'll see deployment, view all spaces. So I, earlier today, I already created a space called production. So let me create another one. So let's create a space and this is my workshop deployment. Okay, and it's asking you to, to use a machine learning service. So this is the one I created before. I pick that and click on create. So this takes a couple of seconds again. Alternatively, I could have clicked on this link and it would have taken me to the same page. So feel free to use this. Once the space is created, I need to get the, the unique identifier for that space and add it here. So let's wait for this to finish. Let's see if, uh, are you able to follow in the chat? Let, let us know if, we, if you're not and I can repeat some of these steps. But we are almost there. All right, so it created a new space for me called workshop deployment. And I need to get the UID, which if I go to like manage tab at the end, here's my space grid. That's what I need. You also see it's available in the URL on top here. That's another way you can get it. All right, so let me copy this and let's go back to the notebook and paste it here. Again, all I've done so far is put in my API key my location, authenticated with Watson uh, Machine Learning Service, created a new space, and this, this is where you have to go back to the UI to finish a couple of steps. 
create a new space, get the grid. Let me run this cell. So, and let's run the next one. This will list all my spaces and you can see this is the one I just created, workshop deployment. This is the one that was already there from before. All right, so then I set the default space ID to be this new space ID that I just obtained. Okay, so it says success, that's good. The next step here is creating some metadata around my model that I want Watson Machine Learning to save as, as I save the model. So you can see here, I'm telling it I'm using scikit-learn, what version of scikit-learn, I'm using Python 3.8. Um, if you picked a different runtime when you started the notebook, you would have to change this, but hopefully you stuck with the default. And this is the method repository.store model. This is what stores my model, and you can see I'm storing this model called CLF10, and I can go back up to see what that model was. So if we go all the way up here, you can see CLF10 is gradient boosting classifier. That's the one I picked to deploy to Ibm Cloud. So going back down here, I'm saying, hey, client, store this model, CLF10, use this metadata. And I also provided the training and the, uh, sorry, the, the, all of the training data, the input features and the target variable, right? And that's to create a lineage between the model and the training data. So in the future, I can always go back and see for any given model, what data was used to create it, and then what, uh, um, if any metadata was associated with that model. So I'm gonna click enter or shift enter to run the cell, and it's actually storing my model on IBM Cloud. All right, so that cell ran successfully. And in the next one, this is just a cell that um, brings back what was just stored, just to make sure it was successful. So you can see here, it stored my model, this is the metadata associated with the model. And then these are the input fields or input features that were used by the model, right? So you can see all of that information in this cell. It also tells you when it was created. Okay, so we have now got a model stored on IBM Cloud. And the next thing is to deploy that model. And we use that by using this method on the client. So client.deployments.create. Okay, so I'm going to run this and it creates a deployment. You'll see initializing and if it runs successfully, you'll see a successful message at the bottom. All right, here we go. So successfully finished deployment. Now, if I were to go back to my project, let's go back. So let's go back here. Let's go to projects, workshop project, which is what I'm working with today. And let it come up. So you can see here, if I go to, let's see. It's not here. I thought it would show up under assets. All right, so going back to, let's go back to the deployment space. I think it'll show up there. So go back to deployment space and then the workshop deployment space. This is the one I just created. And if you look at deployments, now I have this deployment, right? That we just created 11, 11 a.m. Now it's 11, 12 a.m. So going back to the notebook, we stored the model first, then we created a deployment. Now we can, I mean, the, again, the next few cells are just getting the details of the deployment um, just to, to confirm it was stored. Now this is important. So once you have a deployment, how do you actually use it? So Watson Machine Learning gives you this URL, this endpoint, and this is what you use to run predictions against the model, right? So you make, uh, uh, you make uh, HTTP post requests against this URL and you get back predictions. And that's what section number 12 does here. So I get my scoring endpoint, which is again, this URL here. And then I prep my payload and my payload has the input fields and the values, okay? Um, and then finally, I use the score method. So client.deployments.score. And you can see, you know, there's a pattern here. We said clients.repository.store, clients.deployments.deploy, and then clients.deployment.score to actually score it. So if I run that, you can see I sent it one data, data point and it came back with, <clears throat> 
uh, with a prediction and a probability. You can see the prediction is it's it's thinks or it thinks the uh, it's a class zero, and then the probability is 0.67, and the probability for the other class then is 0.32. And the last two cells here or three cells here, what we are doing is um, we created a, again a utility method to do batch processing because. Initially, or here, we are sending in one row at a time. With this method, you can send in a data frame, which is helpful. So you can see at the end here, we are sending X train data. And this is kind of cheating because we're sending the training data to, but you know, we don't, we don't have any other data to test or to uh, show this prediction bit. So we're resending the, the X train data and we are sending the first 16, zero to 15, so first 16 rows and then outputting the results. So you can see here, once this thing runs. All right, you can see here all of the input variables that we sent. And at the end of it, you will see what the target class is. So that would be a zero or a one, the promoter or, or diffractor or detractor. And then you have the probability score for each one of those classes. Um, and again, in your business problem, you would then decide <clears throat> a threshold for a probability score that works for you, right? So if the probability or the confidence score is 50%, well, maybe that's not as good, right? And so you need to figure out what that probability score is for you. And there are different ways to do that as well in classification model problems. So I know that was a lot. Um, Neeraj, I think maybe I'll pass it back to you, but just to just to recap real quick here. So we created a whole bunch of models. We created 10 models. We looked at the confusion matrix. We looked at, looked at the accuracy, precision, to figure out which model we want to now deploy. Once we picked that model, we then used Watson Machine Learning. We first authenticated with it using the API credentials you had stored earlier. We then created a deployment space where our model will live. We got the grid of the deployment space. And then we use this method to create the deployment and then another method to then score against that deployment using the score method. And then in the end, we, it's just a utility function so we can do uh, multiple inputs at once instead of just giving it one row at a time. So again, a lot to go through, but hopefully uh, you know, once you go through this by yourselves later on, or if you're doing it now, it'll, 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 it'll definitely make more sense when you, once you're running the cells yourselves. So Neeraj, I'll stop sharing and hand it back to you at this point. Yep, thank you, Claire. And uh, so where you, we are now, I think, so we have taken one more step where we've been able to, like, I think we've been able to uh, split the data into train and test. We selected the model based on the metrics we looked at. Then we evaluated the performance metrics and we finally added like, you know, uh, a way to, uh, Kind of, you know, and demonstration part is one I think we should look at. I think that's the one we have not covered. So now I think we are at a point where we have the model, we have algorithm, we have our code, but to be able to stand in front of the business, I mean, honestly, they're not going to look at our new notebooks and we have to understand in a very simple way what we are doing. And this is what we kind of, you know, in our scenario, we built it for our stakeholder CIO and we told him that, okay, hey, we looked at a bunch of time-based variables, a geography-based variable, a dollar base, and the real-time sentiments and emotions on the customer. Uh, inputs that they're providing us and based on that we are predicting a case you know whether what direction is it heading towards then on top of that we have another layer because the journey of the case when they interact with us can start from day one uh, and you know it can go on up to day n and we continue to run this model or algorithm on on those interactions every every second based on our real-time definition and we continue to predict and this is one chart that kind of you know uh, you know, so basically, you know, we that allows the stakeholder to understand how the overall algorithm is working because they we can we would never ever get an opportunity to open our notebooks algorithms with them. So this could be like a kind of a demonstration slide for them. Now, having said that, when we have done that, then the next one to look at is, I mean, there have been times when you would have to maybe, you know, put up like a, a proposed solution or like, a, you know, what are you doing end to end? So what we have. We generally have to put more like an architecture, you know, basically, or say that it's not really an architecture, but like how it's working solution end to end. So we have been collecting data from like multiple data sources. 
then we are scoring them on the real time basis and while using watson and multiple other uh, components we talked about and then uh, we need to make this available to somewhere so that people can start using it and it can be in any ticketing tool like service now salesforce or based on you can have your own ui uh, design built up uh, so that will be a proposed solution and finally this could be one of the one of the maybe proposed ui i mean i'm just sharing as an example like you can see uh, some filters on the top you know and then then you know showing which this is a geography where most of the detractors on happy customer you know interactions are lying right now and then based on the revenue i mean who are sometimes you know it's like a heavy paid customers and me again everybody is important because sometimes the startups are also very important based on everybody's priority which team is looking at them is it a growth team is it like a mature team you know there are different teams aligned to different scope of the work so some teams can focus on the startup organizations who are here and they are unhappy because they may not have a great revenue but still they're very important from the growth per se so this could be one of the view and and earlier the way you were looking at the data or like all coded data but then we reverse engineer the data and get back the original values and tell them these are the key fields uh, and these are this is the likelihood of the customer being unhappy and like upkar was saying saying that not i mean nobody given we have 500000 cases a year nobody would have time to look at you know hundreds of cases so we can put a threshold like point whenever our accuracy is with the confidence of 95% and above where that only gives us like a 10 20 50 or 100 cases based on the capacity or the time that people are giving to a project like this to study the you know uh, selected selected cases and then work with the customers to address the problem so we can use a threshold but this would be kind of a ui that will come up and like i said you know ideas are easy execution is everything uh, and it comes from john doer one of the one of the favorite quote i have here uh, another one here uh, and that pretty much i think uh, sums up and um, so we talked through this so far already and uh, with this you know another exercise for all of you how do you plan to consume the output of your models what metrics would you use uh, as a reference and uh, with this i think uh, you know we are at a point where we have also talked about how do you consume the predictions and in a way how we kind of integrated the solution and for the as per the instructions from cio in their ticketing system then they can start consuming the information and that pretty much uh, summarizes the uh, workshop and uh, so with this i would like to hand over the session to marin okay thank you very much I hope all of you really um, enjoyed thinking through how you could apply this to a business problem that you have. I want to thank Niraj and Upkar for taking us through this in uh, in such a experiential way. Um, so we would love your feedback uh, if you want to, you know, let us know if this is something you would like to see. Uh, different versions of in, in future conferences. Just uh, give us some feedback in the chat. And uh, we look forward to having you join the data science uh, community of interest and the LinkedIn group. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the open group. Um, let's see, John or Maggie here, or Jim, here we go. <laughs> Uh, thank you uh, to all of you, Maureen, uh, Ukkar, and Niraj, uh, for your presentation and the workshop. Um, I'm sure the audience enjoyed it. Uh, for those who are uh, in attendance still, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the Data Science Day uh, at our international virtual event. Um, we do make uh, videos of these presentations available, so look for those maybe uh, it'll probably be a uh, week after next before those get posted to the open group YouTube channel, but you can find that information there. Um, you'll probably see a follow up email from the open group as well. Uh, sometime between now and then uh, with links to, to those things. Um, and if you have interest in joining the open group, um, you can reach out to us at member services at open group.org. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have uh, or get you involved in whatever part of the open group you want to. Uh, engage in. So thank you all. Hope you all have a great day and uh, we'll see you at our next uh, quarterly event.